floating stations on Venus, secret bases on Io, and the little things that matter. Let's do the Science of the Expanse, Season 2, Episode 13. So it was the season finale this week, and it was one heck of an episode full of a lot of story and adventure, and a few items that really caught my eye. My eye, I thought it would be interesting to talk about today on the show. First is we have the scientific research vessel, the Arbogas, going down into the atmosphere of Venus. I thought the design of the ship was interesting, as well as the way it expressed some of the ways we might actually explore Venus with a scientific vessel. One of the first things I want to point out is, actually, I noticed this time around, the engines on the bottom of the Arbogast, they're not Epstein drives, or at least they don't look like the drive cones of Epstein drives we've seen before. And I tried to think about why that would be, and I couldn't come up with a reason. So let's start with my theory early on in the episode. So use the hashtag my theory, and I'd love for you to give me your opinion on what the drives of the Arbogast are like and why they're sort of these traditional rocket cones. At least that's what it looks like to me. I couldn't find anything in the books or the wikis about what's going on here. So I thought that was sort of interesting. Why isn't it using an Epstein drive? Is it detached from another ship? Is it uh, not using it because it doesn't ignite the atmosphere? It's worth noting that a little bit later in the episode when the Martian ship goes down into the atmosphere of Venus, it's not using its Epstein drive either. I found that fascinating. It's just using the maneuvering thrusters or the landing thrusters, depending on how you look at it. And it wasn't using the Epstein drive cone itself. So is there some property of the Venusian atmosphere that would make that undesirable? I don't really know. It's mostly carbon dioxide. So we'll talk about that a little, little bit. But I thought it was interesting and I'd love to hear your theory. So use the hashtag my theory, leave your comments down below, and I'd love to hear sort of your thoughts on why this doesn't seem to have a traditional Epstein drive uh, on the bottom of it. Okay, so back to the atmosphere of Venus itself and what we're seeing here. So Venus, um, it is very much Earth-like in terms of its size and its density. It's often called our sister planet, but that's where the similarities stop. The atmosphere on Venus is extremely different than here on Earth. On Earth, it's about 75% nitrogen, about 23% oxygen, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and a few other gases as well. On Venus, the atmosphere is about 90 times the density of the atmosphere here on Earth. It is incredibly, incredibly dense. It is about the equivalent of being about 3,000 feet below sea level here on Earth. So the, t- the pressure is tremendous. Um, it is also about, it's a, it's a tremendous amount of nitrogen. I think it's, uh, excuse me, carbon dioxide. It's around 96% carbon dioxide with uh, somewhere around uh, 3% nitrogen and then trace amounts of other gas like uh, sulf- uh, sulfur dioxide and so forth. So it is quite a different atmosphere than here on Earth because of the the carbon dioxide. There's this runaway greenhouse effect. The temperatures on the surface of Venus reach somewhere around, I think it's uh, 850 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's incredibly, incredibly hot, incredibly uh, high pressure on the surface and very hostile uh, for, for most Earth or even equipment. We put a few probes down there. They don't last very long. They get crushed and cooked pretty quickly. So it's not something, an environment we've been able to get to. However, something that's interesting to note is that many people have said that Venus might make a better candidate for putting a base on than almost any other planet in the solar system. And that is because while the temperature and pressure at the surface are incredibly hostile, once you get about 50 kilometers up, the conditions are almost Earth-like in terms of pressure and temperature anyway. The pressure is about one Earth atmosphere and the temperature kind of ranges between Uh, sort of a very hot, uh, I think somewhere around 60 degrees Fahrenheit to around 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, it, you could actually survive if you could float in an up, in that upper atmosphere, which wouldn't be that hard to do. And I think that's what we're seeing on this vessel, the Arbogast here. It certainly seems to be a vessel entirely designed for the study of Venus. And I say that specifically because it uses when it goes into the atmosphere this deployable sort of air brake and flotation device. You see these side panels come out when it descends into the atmosphere. They deploy, and it has two real functions. First, it it slows the vessel down. The drag on the air is very, very high, so you almost don't really need a parachute. That's how dense the atmosphere is in Venus. So it can slow the vessel down to something reasonable. I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of um, a blast from the thrusters that slow it down a little bit more. But for the most part, this uh, air brake shield can slow it down. But also, you'll notice they're an inflated set of balloons. So they would also serve the purpose of allowing that vessel to float above the surface of Venus. Uh, 
that balmy section where it's uh, very much Earth-like. So it could float there for quite a while. Venus's atmosphere is obviously corrosive, but people sort of overblow the, the corrosive nature of the atmosphere. It's actually the pH is some is low, but it's not so low that it would just immediately dissolve everything. And people are projected to be able to, at the right altitude anyway, go outside of a vessel with a breathing mask on and only a little bit of protection. They wouldn't need a full vacuum suit or full pressure suit. So it's not something that would just dissolve a ship away. Later on in the episode, it's revealed that the bad guys have a secret base stuck on the moon Io around Jupiter. That's what this moon here, it's, in, it's Io. Looking into it, it's actually a great place, I think, for a secret base if you're going to put one. It's not that far from Ganymede, obviously, so you would think they would easily see people coming on and off the planet, but that's not necessarily true. There's a couple of factors. First, Io does not have an atmosphere to really to speak of. It's a trace atmosphere, but it has an incredible amount of volcanism on it. So it would have lots of dust in the atmosphere. It would be sort of unstable. It's so close to Jupiter that it travels in this ring of radiation that surrounds Jupiter, the planet itself. So it's constantly awash in radiation. If you're using stealth propulsion to sort of get off of the planet, any emissions you had from the ship might be masked by the general background radiation of that, of that ring, as well as the fact that Io actually goes around Jupiter about four times for every one orbit of Ganymede. So there would be quite a number of orbits. I think it's something around 42 hours. So there'd be a number of windows that potentially you could get off of Io without being seen because it's blocked by Jupiter or blocked by one of the other moons or just the general movement would make it so that it's, it's fairly easy to get a liftoff window where you wouldn't be seen. So actually I thought that was a great place to hide a base. The one downside is as I mentioned, so there's quite a bit of volcanism. You'd have to make sure you pick a spot that didn't wasn't prone to getting buried in lava and there's quite a few volcanoes here, but that's easily doable, so not a problem. So I actually thought that was pretty interesting and pretty smart on the part of the showrunners to put a base there. It's uh, someplace you could hide something pretty easily. Just a couple of small comments about little details in the show that I really kind of appreciated and it makes the show quite enjoyable for me that the, this is small attention to detail. The first is we talked about hydroponics before when Prax goes into the, the galley of the Rosinante. He sees these coffee beans growing in a circular pattern. That's actually a common uh, method for hydroponics used on Earth right now. That circular pattern uh, increases the amount of light that those plants get and actually increases the yield. So it's, uh, it's actually enjoyable to see them use a real technique. Later on, this really isn't science, but I'll say it's a sweet science of pugilism. Uh, Bobby, one of my favorite characters, is seen going at it with a member of the crew on the ship that she's trapped on, and she gets into a fist fight. And I just want to point out, I I've done a little bit of boxing, by the way, and that's why I noticed it. She she must be a boxer. She must have some kind of boxing training because that is a honest-to-goodness punch she is throwing in at, at that guy. That's not a movie punch. That's totally, she knows what she's doing. She cranks on that hook and she just gives it to him really solid and he goes down. So I just love that level of attention to the show. It brings a lot of enjoyment to me and it increases my overall happiness with what I see and it doesn't break my emergence. So it's a lot of fun for me. So there wasn't that much science to talk about this week. It was mostly a story-driven show. It's just something I enjoyed doing commentary on. I continue. I will continue to do that even though that the season has wrapped up. I'll have future episodes on general science behind some of the, the elements of The Expanse. I'll start to branch out into other shows as well. This has been really enjoyable for me to do, and I hope to keep getting better at it and keep doing it. I'll still post a weekly show on Monday, so please show up every Monday for a new show. Uh, I'll keep this going for a little while, and thank you for watching so far. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, it would help me a lot if you please click the like button below. If you want to catch future episodes, be sure to click the subscribe button and for notifications, click the bell icon next to subscribe to get a pop-up window when I post a new show each week. If you think your friends might enjoy the show, please click the share button below to tell them about it on Facebook and Twitter. As always, I'd love to hear your comments on what you heard today, what you enjoyed, if we left something out, and if you have something to add. If you've gotten this far, use the hashtag Caliban, and I know you've gotten all the way to the end. You can follow me on Twitter at Streamweaver and leave a comment there. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to your theories this week, and as always, stay curious.